Hi, thanks. Um, so we'd like to talk about on location and about some of the particular decisions and challenges we had in designing it. Basically, on location, when we took on the task, was about designing a game about something that doesn't happen. For that reason, we had to be very clear about transparency, about making sure that players understood exactly what the experience would be. On Location is a weekend LARP that ran in, in the UK in December last year and will be running again this year in summer. Um, the LARP is based in the 1930s. There's a cast and a crew waiting to film a movie. They're waiting for their director, Gottfried, to arrive and waiting, and waiting, and he never does. And this is something that's understood by the players. But hopefully, the experience for the characters is that they go in, there is some hope. We want drama and heightened emotions. Old lovers, siblings, people who hate each other have all been confined to a small house. There's also a theme of existential angst. What does it mean to have faith in something that's not happening and still not happening? What does it mean for you? What does it mean for the people around you? And how does it change you? We took the decision to, as, as I mentioned, we took the decision to design for complete transparency. We didn't want players going in thinking they were actually waiting for a director to turn up and it was going to be a LARP about making a film for the most part. Um, we took the decision to say you are going in and you are going to be trapped in this house and nothing is going to happen, which can be a bit of a hard sell. But what we hoped from the character experience is that it would start off with some initial hope some faith in, in someone who, who might arrive, who would arrive. All the characters had been offered a chance to do something different, a chance to become someone new, to, to get rid of the toxic situations that they were stagnating in and break out of them. For example, one of our characters, and a lot of our characters are based on film archetypes, one of our characters is the girl next door, and in her professional and personal life, she's very likeable, very kind, very down to earth. But her darker side is that actually she's repressing a darkest part of herself, and she gets offered a chance in this film to play the villain. So she's got something to wait for, something to hold on for. So the characters needed to hold on to that initial faith, and they needed to accept strange things. But because the players knew that actually this film was never going to be shot, they also needed to do some steering. So they needed to respond maybe with stronger emotions than if they'd just been offered the job of their lifetime and the director was arriving tomorrow. So I just want to talk a little bit about the character design. Um, on location is allowed for 32 characters, and we constructed a network of support and opposition among them. So, for example, this angry character shouting in the background, he is the prop master, who's in charge of the various props that are required for the film, and he is governed by his will rather than entrusting his life to fate. His attachment is to things of the world, to feelings, to sensations and to experiences, rather than the more austere pleasures of the intellect. And he's self-sustaining. He has no need for other people and he doesn't care what other people think about. Each of the 32 characters had a different set of combinations of these values um, around which their archetype and their backstory, their life, their goals and ambitions were built. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> And we connected them together so that each character was supported by those archetypes who were close to them, and they were in opposition to those archetypes that were defined on the opposite ends of the axes. So the idea was there'd be this network of tension. If the 
mood of the LARP as a whole starts to strain too much in one direction, then there'd be a feedback from the opposed characters which would pull it back. And we keep in this balance of faith and uncertainty which we wanted to sustain through the LARP to allow the players to steer at their own pace rather than it all kind of going out of control in one direction or the other. The LARP took place in two acts because we only had a weekend to do it in. So the first act was a day, a typical day in the life of the location shortly after they'd arrived. So they were waiting for their director, they were rehearsing and getting on with building the sets and so on. The second act took place several weeks later while they were still waiting. We wanted to convey this feeling that a long time had passed and that every day had been basically the same and that they were feeling this was increasingly pointless and destructive. Um, we had a few tools that we used for doing this. We built each day and that we actually had in a ritual way. So the day of the LARP started with all of the characters gathered around a table, a piece of music played while they were led into character by a, a small guided meditation. And then the location manager character read out a letter from Gottfried, the absent director, in which he said, I'm sorry, my dear friends, that I've not been able to join you on the set today, but I'm sure I'll be with you tomorrow. In the meantime, keep doing these things I've asked of you. So, that started the first act off, and the, and the players were kind of like, oh, OK, fair enough. We'll get on and do our jobs, and he'll be along tomorrow, of course. The second act started in exactly the same way, but by now, the characters had had this happen many, many times over the intervening weeks, and there was a feeling of, of disgust, mistrust, disillusionment around the room. We used the um, act break to symbolize this degradation and debasement that was going on in the LARP by physically, um, ourselves, the organizers, and the players together, we physically distressed the environment. So the house had been quite nicely decorated, the rooms had been laid out, we made the paintings crooked, we turned over the furniture, there was a Christmas tree in one room which we turned over and um, sort of destroyed the bubbles that were hanging on it. And um, the players distressed their own appearance as well, the appearance of their characters. So they tore their clothes or unbuttoned them, they smeared their makeup, they disheveled their hair. And this represented, in a very sort of personal and physical way, the strain that they, they, they were put, being put under by this existential uncertainty. What was the purpose of their lives? What was the faith journey that they were going on? Where was it going to take them? So we provided these. Um, tools in our design, but the players also came up with their own stuff, which we hadn't expected, which was kind of amazing and wonderful, and also slightly scary. <laughs> <laughs> so one of the things that um, the characters were supposed to be doing, Gottfried had told them, was to improvise and rehearse scenes that might be in this imaginary movie, which was never going to get filled. And our idea was that the characters would use this to draw upon material problematic material from their own lives that they'd represent acting in scenes with one another with the alibi of like a further level of character on top of the characters that are actually playing. And we thought there'd be like a wide variety of this stuff going on, that people would play a load of different scenes and they'd bring their issues out into the open. But it didn't work out like that at all. In fact, the players only created, I think, three different scenes, but they rehearsed them again and again and again during the course of the LARP. And through repetition, they evolved and they became increasingly strange and bizarre. So what had been quite, natura <laughs> what had been quite naturalistic scenes to start with became very surreal and played heavily upon these questions of what did their existence even mean in the context of the LARP. Okay, so I'll just talk briefly about one of the key lessons we learned from taking this approach was that we hadn't somehow quite taken into account that the players were aware that Gottfried wasn't coming and that there was an early loss of faith from the characters. Um, quite often, just in actions, for example, sets weren't created. We'd prepared some quite fun sets, like we had an iceberg set, we had a Christmas tree set, and we weren't sure why they weren't being touched. And there were lots of actions that didn't seem to be taken by the players. So we decided we'd send personal telegrams to some of the players from Gottfried. Uh, contradictory, 
with a time of arrival, a possible instruction, possibly giving someone else an instruction which contradicted that, um, to get a message across, which worked. And the players started getting into character, creating the rehearsal techniques that um, Mo was talking about. It, put, it caused a bit of a problem for us because we were discussing, really, we want Gottfried to appear as a mysterious agent, someone who's not really present in the house and doesn't really dictate what the, what the characters do. But now we've suddenly brought him into a very hands-on position. And it's a shame, in a way, it, in that... Having to, in having to make that decision, and we just we decided actually it depends on the run of the LARP, it depends what the players need, so we're just going to steer for whatever that happens to be. Um, and finally, I'm aware I'm running out of time, I want to talk very quickly about the ending. So the ending of the LARP, which I'm going to talk more about at Designers Hour on Sunday, um, is symbolised by a door opening a bright light shining, and characters who want to leave the manor walking out into change, whatever that signifies for them. And the ones who, want to, who stay stuck in the toxic routines stay within the house. And leaving wasn't always a positive. For example, we had a character who left to commit suicide. Um, staying was always stagnation, even if stagnation itself wasn't a negative. Basically, we left what the choice meant to the player. So just quickly to sum up, that was on location. We designed for a tension between player knowledge and character knowledge about what was going to happen, or in this case, what was not going to happen. Some of the stuff that we put in worked really well, some of it didn't work so well. The players came up with a load of brilliant ideas too. So we're, going to, we're building on those experiences. We're running it twice more this summer. You're all encouraged to sign up um, because it's going to be bigger and better and more wonderful than it was before. We basically, we had a fascinating experience organizing the first run and um, the second and third runs are going to build upon that. Thank you very much. Thank you.